Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Clément Cheroux, uh, and I'm the senior curator uh, of photography here at SF MoMA. Uh, tonight, we are very, very happy to have the artist uh, Jeff Wall uh, to talk about the work of Walker Evans. Uh, the museum is very fortunate to have a close and long standing relationship with Jeff Wall. In 2007, the SF MoMA co-organized the traveling retrospective of his photograph and works. Um, uh, we are also very fortunate uh, to have uh, some works uh, from Jeff Wall in the collection and uh, works such as In Front of a Nightclub, a promised gift uh, to the museum, have become iconic uh, for the visitors of the museum. Currently, Jeff serves as one of SF MoMA's artist trustees, uh, representing key eras uh, of the museum programming as well as the wider artists community. Um, hailing from Canada, Jeff is widely recognized uh, as an innovative uh, picture maker who draws on the story of painting and film to create dynamic theatrical works. But the creative lineage of photography remains for him a primary source of inspiration, especially the work of Walker Evans. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me welcome Jeff on stage. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that we could have this uh, opportunity to talk together about, uh, about Walker Evans. Uh, I would like to start this uh, conversation with a very, very uh, simple and easy question. Um, um, I've been rereading all your uh, interviews and essays to prepare that uh, that conversation and um, Walker Evans, in addition with Volz, the German uh, photographer, and Boifard, uh, the, the French photographer, um, uh, these three photographers, but especially Evans, are the one that you discuss the most often in your writings and interviews. Um, I have some. It works. Yeah, so here we have one uh, Jacques-André Boifard photograph, one Volz photograph, and one Walker Evans photograph. So I would like to, to start this discussion by asking you what was your first encounter with the work of Walker Evans, uh, and what immediately struck you or not in the work of Evans? Um, it's so long ago, it's hard to remember exactly, but I, I feel like... Um, I had encountered uh, his work almost certainly as an adolescent. Um, when I was uh, 10, 12, 14, 15, and 16, I was drawing and painting all the time. That's where I began. And um, I had, for some reason, gotten interested in, in a sort of peripheral way with photography, even though I was more interested in painting and drawing. Um, and I have still drawings I've made at the age of 14, copied from pay, uh, images from, for example, Robert Frank's The Americans, Americans. Mm -hmm. and uh, other things like that. So, and because it's such a long time ago now, it's hard to reconstruct the circumstances of why I was doing that. Mm -hmm. um, was, it, was it with a book, American photographs, or was it through an exhibition? I think it was through the family of man because this exhibition uh, was in the middle of the 50s, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. 58. I would, have I would say 55, but a bit. Uh, and the book, the Time Life book, came out at that time, and I know that both of them, and, and Frank was certainly in uh, uh -huh. um, The Family of Man. In any case, I can't remember, but I know that it goes back from the very beginning. And I like to think 
that uh, as a child I could uh, identify and appreciate artistic excellence without having been taught how to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I feel that that was something that, that always existed for me, that I had an instinctive appreciation mm -hmm. for what I would call better art. Um, so when I was a kid, I liked Bruegel and Rembrandt and Picasso and so on, seeing them only in books, of course. Mm -hmm. And I had a similar relation to photography. And it was Evans f and Frank originally maybe because they were Americans and in Canada there was a little bit more of an access mm -hmm. to um, American photography at that time that jumped out at me in immediately. And so I've had a relationship with them for with them and a few others for a very long time. Uh, my friend Roy Arden and I have spent a lot of time arguing and talking about photography mm -hmm. in the last 20, 30 years and made our own sort of little canon mm -hmm. of photographers that we find most impressive for us. And that has always remained Evans, mm -hmm. um, Ajay, mm -hmm. Frank, Ouija. Um, Is there something in common and between... And Vols, of course. And? And Vols, of and course. Vols. And, and, and is there something in common between these photographers for you? Um, I think that... Uh, uh, let me answer it just uh, by going to the side, f that, that, that by just going to the side for a moment. Um, we were talking, Clément and I were talking a little bit beforehand, and I mentioned that um, it's always seemed to me that Evans is one of the least popular and most disliked of the great photographers. People tend to dislike his work more than most photographers because of his, his sort of um, negative, sarcastic, caustic, dandyish um, uh, attitudes full of scorn and even hatred for things. <laughs> um, and, and and this, of course, c uh, contrasts very much with a beloved photographer like Henri Cartier-Bresson. So, um, and I think that it wasn't so much that Evans was a nasty person or a sour uh, you know, personality or anything like that. I think that Evans was someone who was formed in the era of anti-art, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that he um, saw photography as mm -hmm. a way of, of, of going against the sort of piety mm -hmm. and flamboyance and pretension of what was called art. Mm -hmm. Especially art in photography. He was against Stieglitz, for example. He, he clearly stated that he wants to do something different. Yeah, he gave Stieg Stieglitz a very bad time, uh -huh, uh -huh. which Stieglitz, of course, really didn't deserve at all. Mm -hmm. um, and aficionados of Evans start thinking that there's something wrong with Stieglitz. Mm -hmm. um, I never bought that aspect of him because mm -hmm. I was never so anti-art mm -hmm. as, as Evans, That's and I couldn't have been because when I entered the picture, let's call it in the 60s, mm -hmm. it's my view that the, uh, the, the era of anti-art was coming to an end. Mm -hmm. I think Evans is, in photography, the greatest exponent mm -hmm. of, the, of what I would call an anti-art view. Mm -hmm of photography, and we can talk about that more mm -hmm. later. But there's something about it that struck me. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things that struck me very early on, mm -hmm. was that um, he embodied this very important way of thinking mm -hmm. about culture mm -hmm. um, in, a, in, in, a, in, in such a sophisticated fashion mm -hmm. that it was um, irresistible. I, I found it irresistible in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, Wolfs is another very kindred spirit mm -hmm. to uh, to Evans. In, in in some ways, he even more mm -hmm. had a reason mm -hmm. to be anti high culture, shall we say? He was out of the because he was the art world. He was uh, he has no nobody interested in his work. So that was something totally. And different. he lived closer to the sources of of high modernism at the mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. because he was in Paris mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. Evans was of course in Paris literally at the same time, mm -hmm. almost at the same time. Mm -hmm. No, Evans was there earlier, but so uh, that kind of um, anti-art uh, attitude, w s you know, spoke very powerfully to anybody who was interested in what was going on at the moment, mm -hmm. let's say around 1960. Mm -hmm. So I know that's what hit me. In retrospect, I know that's what hit mm -hmm. me about Evans at the time. Um, can we maybe 
Sweet. Please, please. I will, I will put aside the next part of the, my answer because I have something else to say about it, but we'll get back to it. Okay. Um, I would like to, so we are now showing a, a, a photograph, one of the probably the most famous photograph from Walker Evans. And I would like to um, remind you that in 2011, during a retrospective of your work at the Palais des Beaux-Arts in Brussels, uh, you mixed your own photograph with the works of other artists, including uh, Walker Evans, Balls was also presented, and you choose uh, this uh, penny picture display uh, photograph from 1936 in a print that come from the San Francisco Pilara uh, Foundation collection, and which is also the one that we have here uh, in the in the in the exhibition on the on the third floor. Uh, so this is one of the most iconical uh, photograph from from Evans. Uh, it's an image of images. It's an image, it's a portrait of photography, and it's also a portrait of America. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, what, what is your interest in, the, in, this, uh, uh, in this photograph? Um, I think that the print that Andy Pilara lent us was a vintage print. Yeah. And I have the crap uh, Library of Congress $100 print. Mm -hmm. Um, hanging in, my, in the front door of my studio. And it's been hanging there for a long time because it says studio on it, so you walk into the studio and you know where you are. Um, I mean, I, I think when I, it was th that picture was selected for that exhibition partly because it, it was circumstance and also it's sometimes difficult to get um, pictures. It's a great one and it's it obviously appropriate. Um, I... I, f I feel like, um, as you say in the catalog and in, the in, in your explanation of the exhibition, the catalog, that, of course, this picture is perfectly a perfect example of what you, your argument about Evans as an imitator, well, I think of him as an imitator of the vernacular. Mm -hmm. I don't think that he himself in any way did vernacular photography. He imitated mm -hmm. the modes of this and that genre of yeah. vernacular photography. Evans was very much not part of the, um, of the common mass of photographic practitioners yeah. or consumers. He stood apart from them in the Baudelarian sense of the dandy yeah. who stands completely apart from the crowd. Mm -hmm. But as a photographer, must imitate the language of the crowd in order to pr paradoxically produce something um, not the same. Mm -hmm. So um, that mimesis that he carried out, and he's of course not the only one, but mm -hmm. he, I think that great photography of, the, of his period was carried out as a mimesis of essentially reportage mm -hmm. in one mm -hmm. form or another. You call it vernacular. Mm -hmm. Photography. I think you can also call it reportage mm -hmm. in a, s a parallel sort of way. Mm -hmm. And there are many reasons for it, which we can talk about if you like. It has to do with the dominance of the picture press and the mm -hmm. nature of utilitarian nature of photography and so on. Um, that mimesis was, in my view, the mode in which photography first identified itself yeah. as a high art. Mm -hmm. As a as as not at all a vernacular mm -hmm. art, mm -hmm. but as a high art like uh, like Cezanne would be, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think Evans wanted him, his pictures to be uh, looked at the way one would look at a Cezanne or, mm -hmm. or some other e exemplar of uh, the most mm -hmm. refined, sophisticated kind of pictorial art. Um, he had to do it through that mimesis, and that was in a way the fate of of all ambitious photographers from in that period from about mm -hmm. 1930 in the 30s I'd say even the 20s until mm -hmm. the 60s mm -hmm. maybe even the 70s that the the mimesis mm -hmm. of the utilitarian was something that one had to do I came along at a moment when that was no longer necessary mm -hmm. and so and that was really a turning point I mm -hmm. think in the history of contemporary photography the it moment when we no longer had to pretend to mm -hmm. be useful in any way, including useful to the um, 
publication industry. Can you tell us why you think it was not necessary anymore in the 60s? Because um, photography was beginning to be experimented with differently mm -hmm. um, already at that time. Let's, let's say, let's take 1965 or something like that, some moment like that. Um, it was possible to be an artist in an experimental mode by the middle of the 60s um, without having to, and, and, and you could work in photography without having to in any way interact with the publishing industry mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. So, and this had partly to do, of course, with the, the early acceptance of photography in galleries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that you made money in those days, Mm -hmm. But if you had a way of getting along as a younger artist, you simply could bypass the entire mm -hmm. publishing world that people like Evans and all of them mm -hmm. um, had to encounter. That was a loss in that we no longer had to enact that mimesis, that, that had to pretend, we no longer had to make our work by pretending to make something else. Mm -hmm we could start to make what we wanted directly. Mm -hmm. Conceptual art had something to do with it, but also there was yeah. many things happening in photography that um, were beginning to become acceptable in a framework that people like Evans never had the mm -hmm. luxury, in a way, of yeah. having access to. So at that point, the whole idea that um, serious photography had to be done as what he called lyric, or the documentary style and or lyric documentary actually came to a turning point. Mm -hmm. And it was really no longer this fundamental mm -hmm. framework anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, and therefore, one could simply become an artist in the medium of photography mm -hmm. without that mimesis. That mm -hmm. was, uh, I, I think, a real transformation. Mm -hmm. And I remember recognizing that myself in the middle of the 70s, when mm -hmm. I really began to do photography more seriously, mm -hmm. that it was possible to bypass that because the art world had evolved to the point where there was now an audience and there was beginning, just beginning to be a kind of a market for photography mm -hmm. where a person could imagine at least scraping by somehow. Mm -hmm. I mean, I taught in schools for 25 years to support my work at the beginning mm -hmm. from the middle of the 70s, early 70s mm -hmm. until the end of the 90s. And so it's not like we made a lot of money at photography, mm -hmm. but we didn't have to work for time life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that makes a big difference. I would like to, um, uh, you mentioned uh, Baudelaire, um, which is a, a mutual interest uh, uh, that you share with, with Walker Evans, the French writer, uh, Charles Baudelaire. Um, Baudelaire uh, devoted several text and poems about uh, the figure of the rag picker. And um, this postcard, which is representing two rag pickers in, in Paris, was in, uh, in Walker Evans' uh, collection. And through his own photograph, Evans uh, acted like a kind of rag picker. We have um, in the exhibition some of his uh, photograph of trash and junk. Um, um, trash cans and, and, and things like that. And in describing one of these photographs, Evans said, it is Baudelairean. I wish Baudelaire was alive to see it. Uh, I love that, that quotation. Uh, are you, uh, I, I wanted to, to ask you, are you interested in the metaphor of the photographer as a rag picker? And I wanted to know if that is something that uh, was in your mind in doing this uh, image uh, in 1999? Of, uh, how, uh, you know, Baudelaire hated photography. Yeah. So, uh, and, and stated how much he despised it in a very, one of his most famous reviews. So it would have been, it would have been interesting if uh, uh, he could have seen one of Evans' photographs. You know, I think maybe the greatest rag picker photographer was that Jay because Atje photographed the, re the disappearing elements of Paris, that is the buildings, the carts, the vehicles, mm -hmm. the streets that were turning into trash in front of everyone's eyes or disappearing. And uh, in a way, I think Evans, and Evans was, of course, one of the first people to seriously appreciate Atje, mm -hmm. certainly one of the first Americans along with Bernice Abbott. Um, 
And that is, in a way, because his body of work is so fundamental to what we understand as photography, the mm -hmm. rag picking or the salvage metaphor, mm -hmm. the the preserver of the of the outmoded. This is you know entered the the language of the aesthetics of photography right not from the beginning exactly, but certainly from the time of Natchez's discovery, which co co coincides with surrealist, the surrealist interest in him. Um, I, I think that, say, the picture you're showing of mine is, doesn't, um, doesn't tell you anything about m me that, is not already s has, that has not already been said by the others. I, I w in, in, in pictures like this, I'm really following a genre Mm -hmm. that one ha either has a feeling for or one doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's really important about, and something in your question that's very important to say about Evans, is that one of the reasons why his documentary style is so disconcerting and complex is because of his literary nature. Mm -hmm. And I think an, argu an argument can be made that the most intriguing works of pictorial art in in most traditions, and let's just say the Western tradition to keep it simple, those works are made by art visual artists who have an intense literary culture. Mm -hmm. I think you can go and look at all of the artists one admires most and find the same thing. Mm -hmm. So you could almost make a rule that the more intense the engagement with literature, um, how will I phrase this rule? The more intense the relation with literature, the more likely the pictorial art mm -hmm. will be at a higher level. That's not quite, you get my point. Um, <laughs> and Evans is, an, uh, is a great e example of it. Because um, a picture has to begin somewhere mm -hmm. with something that one sees. And the dimension of what one sees is transformed by what one brings to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody knows this in a way. Um, and the more one brings to it, the more likely the selection of the original motif, in the case of photography, that is the seeing of a something, um, will be richer. I think that's true as a general rule, as I said. And then there are these exemplary figures, Evans being one of them. His frustrations of being, uh, his frustration at not being a writer, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think is one of the things that set him off mm -hmm. in, in kind of his trajectory of being the kind of photographer he, he was. I suppose that was some sort of accident. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think he's really in the generation and from, isn't he from St. Louis? Yeah, he is. Like T.S. Eliot, and mm -hmm. he was very aware of T.S. Eliot, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that the interweaving of the sensibilities between the literary and the pictorial have always been intense. And I think Evans' complexity um, is deeply connected to that mm -hmm. issue. And by the way, I think his unpopularity is also, his relative unpopularity is also connected to that issue because mo uh, serious literature, let's call it that, is always problematic. Mm -hmm. it's, it's th th they are th the, the literary texts in question are ones that trouble us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the troubling nature of the phenomenon is at the origin mm -hmm. of, the f of the pictorial moment. And you can see it in, in any number of visual artists. I would like to come back um, mm -hmm. on the question of the documentary style. Um, you to, to Califai is his, his own uh, photograph, um, Evans, spoke in a famous 1971 interview of what he called the documentary style. And um, he wrote, the term should be documentary style. An example of a literal document would be a police photograph or murder scene. You see a document as use, especially art is really useless. Therefore, art is never a document, though it certainly can adopt I that style. End quote. So this is a very famous quotation that we are using quite often as a photo, photo historian or art historian. 
Um, you prefer the expression near documentary. Can you tell us what you have in mind when you use the expression near documentary and what's the difference for you between a documentary style and a near documentary style or a near documentary approach? Yeah, and, and, and to do that, I could, I'll go back to, to the, what I was going to say was the second part of a, a, an earlier answer. Um, Evans, as I said, was an exemplar of anti-art. And we can talk more about that because it's complex. I'm just, it's a complex position. But for the moment, I'll say that he was an exemplar of the anti-art attitude. You know, he had that very hard-boiled, dandyish kind of attitude towards culture that you can see all through the 20s and 30s. You can see it in Hemingway prose. You can see that all the idea of trying to be to be as objective, as direct, as factual, and as shocking as possible, to get away from the finery of art. Now, in the 1960s, Manny Farber, a film critic, did this, made a very famous and, and sort of sarcastic um, um, comparison between two types of artists. The white elephant artist and the termite artist. The white elephant artist was the grandiose figure like Delacroix or someone using all of the rhetoric of fine art to create impressive and grand artworks. And the termite artist was the one who did the exact opposite, worked in the vernacular, mm -hmm. down below the level of high cultural recognition and got to the nitty gritty of things. And this is a reprise in a way of the idea of the, of the, of the anti-art mm -hmm. issue which Evans then turned into the documentary style. Around 1970 or so, I realized that I was a white elephant, that I was not a termite artist, that I was not an anti-art person, that I didn't really think that that uh, opposition was valid, mm -hmm. and that there had been 30 years or more than 30 years in which of course, every artist did not want to be the white elephant artist. One did not want to be that artist. One wanted to be the subversive, mm -hmm. anti-art artist. But I'd grown up always being, fa having fallen in love with Delacroix, Rembrandt, all of these people. I didn't have anything against them. That was maybe my problem. I never had anything against that art, mm -hmm. even though I grew up in the period of, in a way, the you know, the 60s was the, in a way, the, they, it, it, it sees itself as the high point of anti-art. It's actually the end point of anti-art. In some ways, it's even the decline of anti-art into sophomoric anti-art, which is another uh, issue. I think, think by 1970, I had recognized that the era of anti-art had aged. It was no longer the new thing. It was no longer what was the, the way art was going. It had already happened. Anti-art in the Evans sense, had already happened. And this also was, a, by the way, a problem for all the photographers who came after Evans, uh, who tried to find a way further along his lines. It didn't, I don't think that, was, that lineage worked out that well. So I found it was perfectly fine to be, become, I saw myself as a white elephant, which is in a way a rare and fabulous thing to be. There aren't many white elephants in the world, so I, found for myself I could change the terms of that, you know, that polarity and realize that Evans's view had become the orthodoxy. In a sense, that had become the orthodoxy of the moment. And it, uh, that opened a door, along with the fact that we no longer had to um, work with uh, reportage in the way I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. to go somewhere else. And so it, was, it seemed to me that it was possible to go somewhere new and to reverse or even eliminate the poles of that previous problem, <coughs> such that that opened the door again to the rhetoric of art, if you want to call it that way, to the flourishes of art, to the complexity of art, to all the things that, in fact, in the, in the tradition of, of the, the arts, that is, um, all of them, had, pers had persisted through many, many centuries even, not to mention decades. Um, and so that opened the question, opened up the question of how one made, proceed in photography. So that put documentary into a different context because 
Evans had, in a way, by a certain sleight of hand and his influence, made it seem as if, if it wasn't documentary, it couldn't be serious. Mm -hmm. and, and because of his, his own accomplishment, it, and his own, accomplish being, his own accomplishment being as convincing as it <laughs> was and is, that became the basis of an orthodoxy. But what was concealed in that orthodoxy was, were other energies inside of photography. Mm -hmm. This is uh, something I've talked about many times. That the orthodoxy of the documentary style can suppressed in a way, without being suppressive, but in just by, by its nature, um, um, these other energies. And these other energies I had identified with cinematography almost from the beginning. Somehow with, a, with the, with the um, ampler, amplitude, the, the expansiveness of painting, which never had the problem of having to imitate um, any utilitarian um, issue, at least it didn't have it for many centuries. And somehow along with the unknown and I think un still unappreciated uh, fact that some of the greatest photography of the 20th century has been done in the mo in, for motion pictures. Mm -hmm. And so I began to use the term cinematography to d describe a way of working that was no longer bound by the doc idea of the documentary style or the mimesis of reportage, even though it could include them. It's a bit, in a way, like, an, like uh, some people have defined the novel as a literary form in, re in relation to two other literary forms, including verse. A novel is, a, is a, such a loose and open uh, form of writing that it can include any other kind of writing. You could imagine a novel in which a telegram is quoted. You could imagine a novel in which one chapter is a play, like Joyce's Night Town uh, sec section in Ulysses, which is, is literally essentially written as if it were a play. And Ulysses is a great example of a novel that can have any number of kinds of writing in it. Well, cinematography is a kind of photography that can ha have any kind, any number of kinds of photography in it. And we go to the f and, we w and when we go to films, we can see documentary style films. Sometimes they're extremely uh, documentary-ish, uh, therefore they are very near documentary, um, and we can see films that are filled with artifice, and you can sometimes see the, these things in the same film. Jean-Luc Godard in his best period, for example, made films in which complete slapstick artifice is cut to next to something completely documentary and might even be documentary footage. So uh, it seemed to me cinematography, cinematography as a method mm -hmm. opened this door, which included the possibility of working in a documentary mode, which I do, which I do quite frequently, and I've made pictures that are in fact, you know, reportage. Mm -hmm. But I like the term near documentary because I, in, in my pictures that look as if they're documentary, mm -hmm. or I don't work like Evans because Evans made documentary photos with this high-pitched literary sophistication that turned them into works of autonomous fine art, I didn't have to, I could take advantage of the cinema, cinematography, and for example, collaborate with somebody to be in my picture or some other things, and by that means, make the picture appear to some degree mm -hmm. as if it were reportage, but it clearly is not. Mm -hmm. When you say that you you don't work in the same way as Evans was was working, uh, you are uh, talking about the fact that you are uh, constricting, that you are building your your photographs. Um, there is a um, uh, in in the history of photography, um, a lot of photographer has, has been talking about the fact that when they are in front of a subject that they are interested in, suddenly there is a kind of uh, Epiphany, a kind of magical moment in front of that of that reality. Uh, Cartier-Bresson, for example, when he was in front of a subject, uh, says that he was not uh, able to explain what happened, and the only thing that he can do is say yes, 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 uh, yes. That's the subject. That's it. Um, and this is, I think, this is something very, very important uh, for for photography. This kind of of of, of epiphany. Um, I would be interested in, in understanding 
if you are interested in that kind of, of, of epiphany, for example, I wanted to show that, that photograph because you um, had explained about this photograph that uh, you wanted to do a photograph with a door and that you have been researching for that door for weeks and weeks. And finally, at the end, you realize that the door you were interested in were just behind your, your studio. Uh, and so you have this kind of, of uh, magical moment when you discover that that door. And so I would be interested in understanding if if that is something important for, for you, this kind of, of specific moment, which is so important for photography, and how you keep that in your in the photograph that you totally reconstruct. Mm -hmm. Interesting question. Yes, of course. It's. Uh, I don't think. Uh, I think that the idea that at some point one encounters, a, a, a let's call it a motif, a subject mm -hmm. in the world. Um, I think that uh, in the way we're talking, we don't really encounter those subjects as subjects. We encounter them as visual experiences mm -hmm. that have a beauty and a, and a harmony to them that is epiphanic, like you talk about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Evans insisted on what he was doing was all about his I, mm -hmm. that is his ability, I see it, uh, he, what he's saying is that that was his intuitive ability to see something as a picture mm -hmm. instantly before it had become a picture and then hopefully he could carry out what he had to carry out to make it into one. I think that's pretty much, I think that's in common with, that's something in common that everybody who works with images must have. You know, we do sometimes see pictures made by people who don't have that, and that's not exciting. <laughs> <laughs> because, because that has to, that's part of the process. Mm -hmm. In my case, I think all photographers work in a way within a very narrow range of difference one from the other. I don't think there's a whole hell of a lot of difference between what I do and what Walker Evans does. The only difference is that I allowed myself to ask a person or two to come and let me work with them. Um, and Evans would have thought that was, um, to some extent, inadmissible, although he did, he did that plenty himself. Many of Evans' photos were so-called staged, just like many of Car Cartier-Bresson's were staged. This is something that is still not there terribly well researched in the history of photography, the gray area between what is called staged and what is called not. That's one of the reasons I don't like the word staged. Stage suggests a stage, uh, as if there's a known apparatus for a staging to take place. But if Cartier-Bresson was in Mexico and asked a man to hold two shoes because he saw him do it and said, look, just hold those shoes for a couple of seconds more while I, I, uh, while I take your picture, he staged the picture. There's no stage, there's no this, there's no lighting, there's no, there's no um, theater director, there's no uh, set coming down, it's a staged photograph. Mm -hmm. So the word staged isn't really very interesting anymore because it can mean as something as simple as waving at somebody to get them to stop and let you photograph them, you've staged it. it all staging, all, all, all what I call cinematog cinematography is just a collaboration. Mm -hmm. Evans generally ruled out the collaboration. But aside from that, the differences between practice are not very wide. So in my case, I do a lot of what every photographer does, walk, go around places hoping for something to happen to me. The reason I, one of the reasons I began to like cinematography was that that was not, it meant that that was not the only thing one did. Mm -hmm. The thing I never liked about this mimesis of reportage is that you have to go out uh, in the world with maybe uh, um, an aim in mind like I'll go to the circus or I'm going to go to a factory today and hopefully at that place something will occur that will become a picture. That's fine as far as it goes, but it can be exhausting and tiresome to have to run around chasing possible uh, starting points. With the cinematographic method, one can invent a starting point. One can induce a starting point. So in the picture you're looking at now, yes, the, the door was there, 
uh, right behind a building I occupied almost every day and didn't even see it until I had looked around. Uh, because I'd seen a person uh, trying doors, like this guy was doing, mm -hmm. trying doors, and I thought, well, that's an that's interesting subject. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to find someone I could um, do that for me, and I found this young guy. And I didn't know where to do it, so I did look and look, and of course I found this one, paradoxically, at, um, at the starting point. But that in, that's in a way just an episode of what any photographer would go through, um, not noticing the um, thing right in front of your nose, and going far afield and coming back around, it's really nothing different from mm -hmm. from what uh, some sort of um, re uh, reporter would do. Um, that's why I think that uh, one of the, uh, just to add one other aspect is that since I would say, for me at least, uh, that the notion of cinematography opened up the procedures of photography. Um, um, uh, pretty substantially, because I think a lot of people, who, when they were operating from the uh, reportage model, the documentary style model, felt that they did, did have to go out in the world and find some that something that really happened, and that created gave an, you know, that that created an authenticity. It does give an authenticity in the reportage sense, mm -hmm. but it does not necessarily give an authenticity in the artistic sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think they're two different things. A news photo that tells you shows you something about something that actually happened that has been unaltered, has an authenticity as a reportage. It doesn't necessarily have any artistic authenticity because it might not be a very interesting photograph artistically. And an artistically made photograph that has no social authenticity, has no authenticity as reportage, can make no claims to truth in the, on the terms of reportage, mm -hmm. can have artistic authenticity which then allows it to have access to a different Let's call it truth claim or some sort. That's very interesting. Um, I think this is time to open the discussion to the to the public. So if there is any question in the audience, don't hesitate. So here in the in the front. I liked what you said about pictorial and literary references, and I was wondering what texts were formative for you. Um, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't give you a list. I've been reading um, since I was 13 years old, seriously. Poetry, literature, everything. So, um, you know, what can I say? Uh, in, this, in the context of this discussion, T.S. Eliot, Baudelaire, Flaubert, of course. I mean, uh, Evans was insane for Flaubert, uh, who who also was an anti-art writer in his time. He was against all the rhetorics of literature and was trying to write this. He kind of, in, in a way, inaugurated this idea of white writing that came became so important in France all the way up to Robe Grey and, and so on. Um, so in the context of this discussion, you would have to say, you know, the modernist experimental novel from Flaubert maybe to where, I don't know. Recently I reread John Dos Passos' USA, which I hadn't read for 30 years, and thought it was a second-rate novel, but really an interesting literary construction. So I think all serious, seriously meant literary work in any genre, from a haiku to you know a, a thousand-page novel, um, is what we need. And I think it's, it is really difficult, especially in, and this is true in Canada as well as from what I understand in the United States, that the teaching of serious literature is really not being done very much anymore. And it's been already a few generations that this is not happening. So that young people who are 12, 13, 14, 15, aren't being exposed to things that if they were exposed to, would probably transform their sensibility. Let's not say their social life, but at least their sensibility. I notice when I go into bookstores, there's now this huge section called youth, what's it called? <laughs> Young adult. You see, this is a part of the problem, this mass culture element of, of n new genres. I know that literature has to have new genres. But when I was a teenager, I read Crime and Punishment. That was my idea of young adult literature, and that was, <laughs> 
but you see that, but that sort of an encounter is the kind of encounter that um, we need. Just the way one needs to see, let's say, uh, a few Gauguin's or something, rather than some kitschy thing that one uh, um, um, encounters through the mass media. So it's an old-fashioned view that there's a thing called high culture and that high culture is complex and it makes demands on us and on our sensibilities. This is something that's simply slowly, you know, moving a away from the center of discussion. I think it's a big problem in the formation of artists. I know that I'm a completely different person than I would have been if I had never had those encounters when I was that age and continued them. So some unfamiliarity with your work, and I, like as a as a photography graduate, I obviously know who you are. Um, but nonetheless, I you never say you had do or you don't. I do. Yeah. No, I'm I'm familiar some with don't. Your, I'm familiar with your seminal works, but nonetheless, uh, had no no foundation of where you came from, and and hearing and seeing some of this kind of like more deep brooding sentiment, and then seeing massive color installations. Does that open up a juxtaposition for you in sense of like, like your work and like Crudson's, for instance, incredibly cinematic and, and a lot of depth to like this image, for instance, but at the same time, a pretty image to digest without having an understanding of that foundation in the sense that it's a life-sized picture in color with great lighting. And so, and the problem is what exactly, sorry. No, no problem, just the dialogue of like, this is, this is playing a little more to that kind of uh, more surface level, easier to digest. Oh, I see. Without, without having a dive into who you are, per se. I guess, I mean, I feel like, and in, in, uh, I think any artist would say the same, when you see my work, you've, do you've dove into who I am, um, for better or worse. Um, when we, I mean, we obviously didn't address the issue of scale and the transformation of the physical nature of photography so far, and we can do that if you want, because that seems to be partly what you're asking. Um, shall I, quickly? Um, one thing I've never, I've never really liked about the, uh, the classic tradition of, uh, so let's call it classic photography, and Evans is part of this, is the size of the prints. I've never really responded to those prints hanging on the wall. They, they, they were mostly made in this era of the mimesis of reportage, which meant they were really meant for publication. And the print sizes were page size. And they, of course, they work beautifully in books. And one could argue that American Photographs is the best way to see those Evans pictures in the book rather than hanging on the wall. It's an argument that's been made many times, and I kind of agree with it, even though one loves to see actual photographs. But I was, it just wasn't my way of seeing, because I grew up on painting, with painting more than photography, or at least the painting being dominant over photography, and of course in the cinema, with the cinema. And so I was restless with the scale of um, classic photography. And in the 70s, many people began to work in photography in more experimental ways, and the scale began to become more flexible. So, uh, you know, if you think of people like Jean Legac in the 70s, Christian Boltanski, Klaus Rinke, you know, all the people who worked in the 70s who changed the way photography got put on the wall, and I was part of that, uh, that opened up another way of looking at photographs, and they became more impressive physically, and they resembled paintings. Unfortunately, they also resembled publicity and advertising. And this issue came, uh, came into the whole issue of, sty of one's style at that point, because uh, in the earlier tradition, you could never accuse a Brassai or a Bill Brandt or any of these people of their work looking like publicity. You could maybe accuse Steichen of it, mm -hmm. just like you could accuse Abaddon of it, but most of photographers, they didn't have that look, and they weren't really capable of getting it with the approach they were taking. But we had to, we had to encounter that. I've always tried to um, 
add that kind of, um, I like to think anyway, that I've tried to add, an, or at least that to build my pictures with an element that has always resisted the spectacularity of the medium itself. I've tried to, to create a tension between the, uh, the scale, the color, and the, so, and the more impressive elements and what's in the picture and how it's made and what, how it's composed. I, I, I wouldn't claim to always have been successful in that, but it's certainly been one of the central problems of my making is how to avoid resembling uh, overly emphatic you know, publicity photography, which was something that w really wasn't an issue until this time. So it's, it's for you to judge how, how I've done that. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one more, one more question. <laughs> Make it two then. So I was curious, um, you said something earlier about the imitation of vernacular with Evan's work. And um, I'm a student at SFAI, and I just took a whole class on vernacular and the meaning of vernacular and what qualifies as vernacular. And we talked about Evan's almost every day. And I'm curious as to why, or just what what makes you say that? Cause why, he, why he was imitating it? Yes. I'm just curious, my teacher was on the exact opposite spectrum of that, and it just kind of amuses me, and I kind of want to go challenge. S say that again, sorry? My teacher was on the opposite spectrum of that. What did he say? She oh, that uh, he was the definition of vernacular. Uh-huh, okay. And I'm just curious why you think not. The, well, by, I mean, Clement, you, maybe you agree that the vernacular, by definition, is that which is, as you've written in your, in your essay, is that which is cr created popularly. I mean, for me, the vernacular is three things. The vernacular is what is useful, what is local, related to a space, and what is popular. So for me, vernacular photography is everything that is not art. So it means amateur photography is vernacular, architecture photography is vernacular, reportage photography is vernacular, every kind of useful photography is vernacular. So I have a very large definition of the vernacular, and I think it's... It's, in a way, uh, the opposite of, of what is considered as art. Someone, uh, a photographer, waking up in the morning and saying, I'm, I'm going to make art. So this is an art photographer. It's not a vernacular photographer. And the reason why uh, I'm interested in um, trying to enlarge the concept of the documentary style in talking about the vernacular style is because I think that Evans was not only interested in reportage photography or not only interested in documentary photography, he was also interested in um, postcard photography. He was interested in press photography. He was interested in the photographs that were made for a catalog of tools. He was interested in all these different eras of the what I call the vernacular photography. But um, but Evans, another way of looking at this idea of the vernacular is it is made, like you say, uh, one of the things that uh, connects to it is the amateur. The amateur is a person who is not aiming to make art and is not trained to make art and is not maybe even capable yeah. of making art and has no talent for making art. Um, so that person creates vernacular photography. This is no criticism of that mm -hmm. person. This no. is just a no. characterization of that person. That was not Evans. Evans set out every morning to make something yeah. that he would consider as high art as Eliot's Four Quartets yeah. or Flaubert's Madame Bovary or anything like that. He set out to do that, but because of the era he was in, and because of the nature of photography, he had to, or he felt he had to, do that through a very strict, complex, and sophisticated imitation mm -hmm. of the amateur or the vernacular. Mm -hmm. This is the dandy in action. Yeah. Yeah. This is the most, this is the most uh, opposed position to the common person, shall we call it, that could ever be imagined. So, and he didn't do it with a sense of humor either, by the way, the way Ed Bruchet did it much later, who imitated the common person with humor. Evans had no humor about it. There's no humor of that type. There may be a little black humor in his work here and there, but not in that way. So he, he is not the epitome of the vernacular photographer. He's the epitome of the imitator mm -hmm. of the vernacular yeah. photographer from a position outside the vernacular 
and that not only is outside, wants to be outside, and desperately will yeah, yeah. fight to stay outside the vernacular. Yeah. Maybe one last question on this side. Hey. Um, I'm wondering what you thought of Evans's paintings. Um, this show makes a really big deal about the paintings, about the collections, about the ticket collages. Um, you sort of established that that's kind of more where your art history education started. We also talked about how Evans is sort of an insufferable art snob, um, especially in that book quality. But I find his paintings very sort of sweet and sincere, if untutored, and just wondering what you thought of them. Um, yeah, I think Evans was a was a real art snob, and I think that w we have to. And I know that it, it, and it's it, it's a, it's very much the same in Canada, so I can say this: that the idea of art snob has gotten a very bad reputation the last <laughs> decades, as if it's something elitist that we should really avoid. You know, it's almost a kind of, you know, as if an art snob is a kind of an abuser of some sort. But Evans was an art snob because. Um, the key question about art is its quality, how good it is. Uh, and you can't, you, you, it, unless you deny the idea that artistic quality means anything, which people do uh, and have done for quite some time, but if you d don't deny that, then you will inevitably in encounter the fact that some things are better than others. That's him. I don't think the show made a big thing of it as paintings. I think there's only two paintings in there, weren't there? There's four painting in the in the exhibition, yeah. But that's true. That's not a. That's I think really not a big deal. But I think that uh, I think that what it or what it shows three hundred photograph. That's <laughs> <laughs> what I think it shows that Evans' starting point was not painting; mm -hmm. it was literature. That he he wasn't much of a painter. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it, it's interesting to see the formal in a way the formality of his paintings that he saw architectural his architectural photographs his arrangements of forms and shapes mm -hmm. and so on. Um, I, I think it's kind of interesting that you put the, the paintings in the show. I'd never seen them before. Um, you know, I don't think they enhance no. Evan's reputation very much. <laughs> 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 but, I think they, but I think they show a charming weakness in someone who didn't like to show weakness. So. And m maybe the, the um, I, I should say something about, uh, about that. The reason why I, I wanted to show the uh, the paintings in the exhibition is, um, I mean, the idea is not to show that Evans was a great painter. He was not a bad painter, but he was not a great painter. And the reason why I wanted to show that um, is really because uh, the subject of, of the paintings are interesting. If you look at the subject, we have four paintings. Three are about these small roadside stand and shacks that he was fascinated with. And the other one is about the main street. So the subject of the painting were exactly the same that the subject of he was interested in, in photographing. So the reason why I was interested in showing this painting is, was not to reveal an, in, an unknown uh, Walker Evans, but to try to explain that he was obsessed with this subject. Uh, so that was really the, the point. And um, and but I think we can we can continue this this conversation for a long time. Um, I, I think that that was really great to have you tonight. Thank you so much for answering to all these questions. We could continue this discussion for hours. It's so it's so fascinating. Uh, I mean, Evans is uh, is really a great artist, and we can continue to talk about him for a long time. Um, I would like to thank you for your for your time and for your answer, and thank you so much for joining uh, joining us tonight. Thank, thank you. you.